My guest today is James Heskett, Professor Emeritus at the Harvard Business School, author of books about management and business, consultant and lecturer. Welcome, Professor Heskett. It's really nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. One of your fields of specialization is organizational culture, the understanding of which is very wide, but also changing when the business environment changes. How would you define what is an organizational organizational culture nowadays? Well, I think the view of culture is changing a bit. Uh, the original definition uh, encompassed uh, matters like um, uh, a shared uh, set of values and, uh, uh, in other words, the things we all believe in, uh, a uh, an agreed-on set of behaviors, how we do things around here, and uh, artifacts such as, you know, how we dress, and uh, whether we have a company picnic uh, or that sort of thing. Uh, that's kind of the traditional view that was set forth um, years ago, by the way, at, uh, uh, at MIT by uh, uh, our good uh, colleagues there. And uh, my view is, is, is a somewhat expanded view that starts with mission, you know, why we're doing what we're doing and why we believe what we believe. Um, and then uh, with the other elements, how we measure how we're doing and uh, and what we do about it when the measures don't uh, uh, come up to standard or our expectations or what have you. So instead of this these core elements of strategy, uh, I think of it as having uh, other related elements that make uh, uh, culture work. Uh, I meant the core elements of culture, of course, but uh, when I was just talking about it, uh, and it's these these peripheral elements that uh, make the culture work. How does organizational culture can then influence a company's position in the market? Uh, culture can have an, a significant impact on a company's performance. And in fact, uh, in companies in which there are large numbers of customer-facing employees, elements of culture can influence up to 40% of the operating income of a particular organization, whether it's an entire company or whether it's a, uh, a, a division within the company or whether it's an office and an office staff, uh, because companies harbor many different cultures uh, in a sense, as well as having an overall umbrella culture. Uh, now, if culture can influence that much profit, then uh, it has to be very important. It's important for other reasons as well, because it uh, has an impact on long-term performance rather than the short-term day-to-day uh, activities uh, or other elements of, com of a company's uh, uh, activity. Furthermore, a culture should, if it's a, if it's structured effectively, a culture can support more than one strategy or a strategic change, if that's uh, what you need. So that uh, uh, in this day and age of uh, less long-term planning and more emphasis on agility, uh, culture becomes an important uh, foundation for creating an agile organization. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, culture is really a um, a secret weapon in many respects. Uh, it 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 flies under the radar. It uh, it is often hard to detect. People thought it was hard to measure until uh, several of us began doing that. And uh, interestingly enough, culture is very hard uh, to hack. So that in today's uh, uh, culture, uh, culture of uh, of hacking and copying and uh, stealing and <laughs> all the rest, uh, an organization's culture is a very uh, uh, precious uh, treasure uh, that it can keep to itself in large measure. In your latest book, you write that some company CEOs recognize culture as an important thing, but still hold, hold misconceptions about, this, about it. What are the most common misconceptions about organizational culture? 
Well, among the most common, I think, are that uh, a culture is very difficult to change and that it uh, it takes a long time to do it, often uh, put behind other things uh, in the array of priorities that an organization has. And so consequently, uh, our colleagues at the uh, University of North Carolina have surveyed uh, some a large number of senior executives who have told us, uh, 92% of them, in fact, have told us that their culture could be improved. Uh, when asked how many had actually done something about it, 16% said they had done something about it, which leaves you with a gap of 76 percentage points uh, uh, of top executives that have done nothing. So about three out of four think that their culture uh, needs improvement. And many of them believe that it's important because I think uh, what we have begun to discover is that culture does have an important impact on profit and sales, but they haven't done much about it. And the reason that they're not doing much about it is that they think it takes too long. Uh, many of them are not going to be in their leadership position long enough to accomplishment accomplish it. They are told that it's risky and that only one in four efforts succeed. So therefore, the payoff is reduced. And uh, so consequently, they say, yeah, it's important, but uh, not right now. We'll, we'll, we'll do it later. Well, often later never comes. How does building organizational culture differ in different sectors and industries? Oh, well, it, uh, there are big differences. I mentioned that uh, it, in in my studies, I've, I've looked at organizations that have large numbers of customer-facing employees. Uh, those are the organizations in which culture can have the biggest impact. I'm not saying that it isn't important in, say, a manufacturing setting uh, where there aren't very many people facing customers. Uh, because I can cite some examples uh, where culture has been an important driver uh, of performance uh, in organizations like that. But uh, it's it's clear to me that service organizations are particularly vulnerable to these ideas, uh, that um, uh, those involving uh, a lot of personal relationships, such as financial consulting, uh, counseling, that sort of thing, uh, can benefit very much from it, uh, and perhaps more so than some other uh, industries. I mentioned uh, the uh, the exceptions. Um, uh, Nucor Steel in the United States is is a good example of a company that relies on uh, its culture to a significant extent. Or the founder, Ken Iverson, uh, was a great proponent of organization culture and built a culture in which uh, uh, employees help each other solve problems, even if it means that uh, it will have uh, maybe a negative impact on their short-term performance uh, in terms of their ability to, to turn out quality steel, because that's what Nucor makes. It makes specialty steel products in what are called mini mills. And uh, there are many instances in that organization where when a problem has arisen, people help each other out because uh, even though it's not part of their responsibility, because that's one of the values that they all share. And the fact that someone would get uh, into his car at midnight and drive uh, 300 miles to help a colleague uh, with a problem at his mini mill uh, is accepted behavior. That's the way we do things around here. And so consequently, uh, culture and, and people get rewarded, obviously, for these kinds of behaviors. So that uh, uh, at New Core Steel, they practice the very core elements of culture that I described to you earlier. I would also like to ask you about a matter that is really important, especially for Polish leaders, I think. How should companies build an organizational culture in uncertain times with a war across the border? Great question, because uh, I can only imagine how difficult it is uh, at this time to manage an organization 
uh, in Poland or any one of the other uh, border countries bordering on the Ukraine. Uh, and, and, and furthermore, we have a new generation of potential talent coming along. Everybody refers to it as Gen Z uh, that has grown up in an age of remote work. So uh, you have a uh, you have the combination of turmoil that has made it uh, difficult for people to appear on the job regularly, I'm sure, uh, combined with uh, the new technologies that uh, enable you to do your work from home, combined with this mental attitude that has developed among uh, a generation of people who, for whom remote work is natural. Um, it, it is a very big challenge uh, to maintain an organization's culture under these circumstances. Uh, and I, we face it in, uh, in different ways uh, in this country, but uh, and perhaps not as extreme uh, a situation. But nevertheless, uh, there's a big debate underway right now about uh, how you maintain a culture in uncertain times. Uh, it's clear to me that for at least some significant part of a relationship, you have to provide an opportunity for face-to-face -face relationships. Uh, you can't hire somebody online, allow them to work online, and then dismiss them online, as some organizations in this country have done. That, that's a prescription for disaster. People who are hired, even ex with the expectation of remote work, have to be brought together for some portion of the time. Either it's the three days a week that everyone is required to be in the office under a hybrid remote work strategy, uh, or it's uh, frequent gatherings for people uh, who are working remotely all the time. You've got to have people uh, in a face-to-face -face situation, or you will lose your culture. The the CEO of one of our major banks has said, "You know, uh, we'll we'll be able we'll survive as an organization, but working remotely, we will never be a great organization. Uh, even if we meet the challenges that uh, that you mentioned, and the way you meet them is by." Uh, taking some of the money or all of the money that supposedly organizations are saving by allowing people to work remotely and spending that on ways of getting them together in a collaborative uh, situation with time to create and to understand each other, uh, to relate to one another and the like. Uh, there's one other, uh, I think, one other thing that is really important in times like this, and that is uh, organizationally working in teams. Uh, teams have a, a, a very important role in helping preserve and build an organization's culture. Uh, the way we do things around here are observed by all the team members. They will police or, or, or counsel uh, their team colleagues, if they see them not doing things the way we do them around here. Uh, so you get, and some teams are, are very good at hiring even. Uh, so you get hiring and counseling, uh, which uh, provides the kind of peer pressure that is very important in the establishment and, and maintenance of an effective culture. So uh, one of the, I, I think one of the key things that uh, a company can do when confronted uh, with its, uh, with all of these uncertainties, is to consider how uh, we can do more of our work in teams. I understand that you can't completely reorganize overnight, but you certainly can uh, organize people in ways that encourage them to work together. Uh, to uh, to uh, teach each other, to learn from each other, and to establish the kind of camaraderie that is really important uh, in an effective culture. A problem that is connected to what you just said is the decrease in employee engagement. 
and it's a problem uh, for many companies that arise nowadays. So how do you think companies can address it? You hit on an important topic. The, the Gallup organization has measured uh, levels of engagement on a global basis, including uh, Western Europe. And uh, they have found that in, uh, in areas of Western Europe, uh, one in six employees is highly engaged in their, in their job, their relationship with their organization and the like. And uh, for the other five, it's just a job. Well, uh, in the work that I've done and in my observations, I've concluded that leadership is the most important factor uh, influencing engagement. It, uh, uh, the leader, the immediate leader, that is the team leader, if, you're, if we're talking about teams, uh, can have the, 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 uh, uh, the biggest impact on engagement of any, um, uh, of any other factor. Uh, and it's how that leader acts out the values uh, acts out the behaviors, um, may even uh, adhere to the artifacts of the of the culture uh, that influence people's uh, behavior a great deal, and uh, to a great extent uh, uh, influences their le level of, of of engagement. So, along with the culture of the organization itself, leadership is important. The nature of the job. Uh, the nature of the people, the, the quality of the people with whom I'm uh, performing my work, uh, uh, all of which we're told are important factors in building engagement among employees. When any one of those goes uh, the wrong way, uh, we have a problem uh, with somebody in that organization uh, becoming engaged in what they're doing. And apparently, we have many problems that uh, that we could uh, address, and literally, without changing the nature of our organization, uh, we might have to change a few leaders. Uh, but change uh, to to build engagement uh, is a very viable uh, thing to do. The problem, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, because of these uh, uh, myths uh, that circulate around the time required to change culture and behavior and all the rest, uh, too few leaders really look to uh, changes in culture to make the improvements that you uh, describe or, 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 or ask about. In the Gallup ranking, you mentioned Europe is on the last place when it comes to the employee engagement. engagement. Why do you think is that happening right now? Well, first of all, uh, levels of engagement are low around the world. So uh, Europe may be uh, the lowest, the, the shortest midget in the uh, in the crowd, but uh, it's not much shorter than anybody else. Uh, engagement is a, is an, a, a global issue. I can only speculate on Europe because I really haven't done the research on a geographic basis to know, but. Uh, I suspect that uh, it's possible that um, uh, the various ways of life and the emphasis on life outside the job in Europe has always seemed to me, at least in making the comparisons between Europe and the United States, has always seemed to be a very uh, important, precious thing. Um, in the US, the job, uh, it, it, for better or worse, uh, occupies more of people's time and loyalty and so forth. So uh, it's possible that people are, are uh, uh, susceptible to engagement in some parts of the world, uh, more so than in Europe, because in Europe, uh, at least our friends are highly engaged at home and in their, uh, in their careers outside their jobs, uh, uh, in many respects, they lead lives that are very admirable for some of us who uh, have our uh, uh, mind on the job all the time. And in, a, in that kind of a situation, uh, I think it's, it's, it, it, it's a matter of loyalty. 
and loyalty to the job as opposed to loyalty to the family, uh, to other interests and the like. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's an amateur uh, perspective of a subject that I really haven't studied, but I do have some uh, thoughts about. How to ensure, changing the topic a little bit, that the desired culture is understood by all employees and practiced by everyone in the organization? Oh, well, uh, here we go again. Uh, the uh, uh, It's impossible for people at the top to know what's going on in most parts of an organization. And uh, they're often forced to admit their ignorance when the, when the organization misbehaves. So uh, forget about uh, top management in cases like this. It all takes place in a kind of cascading effect, uh, influenced from the top, but actually administered at various levels throughout the organization. So uh, the local, uh, the, the, uh, the department, uh, for example, or the, the, uh, the team is a much more important organizational element than the entire corporation. Uh, so that's where you have to uh, try to ensure uh, universal uh, uh, development of any idea. And it takes us back again to the way in which uh, work gets done. Does it get done by individuals working alone, uh, maybe at home, uh, uh, or does it get done by people working in teams, either at home or in the office, or does it get done by people working together all of the time, uh, regardless of, of, the, uh, uh, of the way in which uh, emphasis is placed on remote work? Uh, again, I, I am a firm believer in the value of teams as a way of spreading not only spreading ideas throughout the organization, but also ensuring that people um, do and believe uh, about uh, believe things in ways that benefit the work of the entire organization. Uh, in that in that respect, I think senior management has a very uh, minimal role. If you ask, for example. If you ask employees in the organization about whether they trust their team leader or their department uh, uh, head, uh, and then if you ask them if they trust the CEO of the company, uh, the uh, team leader always gets a, a much higher uh, score. Uh, people, you can't trust or distrust somebody that you never see. So uh, they're not quite sure how to answer the question about the CEO, but they certainly are able to answer the question about their team leader. And uh, very often those team leaders get much higher uh, ratings on trust than the leader. And the reason why this is important is this. Trust is the foundation of much of what we're talking about. If, if my organization trusts me, then I, I'm going to... Uh, uh, They'll know that uh, uh, I, that the expectations that we all have will either be met or we'll all understand why they weren't met. Uh, there won't be uh, uh, secrets uh, that uh, uh, are kept forever in the organization. Gossip will be held at a minimum and uh, you will have an effective foundation for an organization in which people do their job and trust that their colleagues will also do their jobs, uh, which is how I got involved in, the, in this uh, subject in the first place, because years ago, uh, Johnson & Johnson, which has a very important credo, which is a set of values that the company uh, that manufactures healthcare products uh, uh, shares, uh, uh, they had a, a, a poisoning of their Tylenol product in the Chicago market uh, that killed seven people. And the poisoning took place 
at the retail level, uh, someone poisoned their, their, their product. The CEO was in Japan. Uh, the local, the local uh, leadership knew exactly what to do because they all share the same credo. And uh, within hours, they announced that all Tylenol on all shelves in the United States would, would anywhere, uh, I don't think it was limited to the United States, would be taken off the shelf. At the time, and this was 40 years ago, these were this was hundreds of millions of dollars of cost to Johnson & Johnson. And the CEO was informed about it. He was out of the country, uh, but there was no question of what they were going to do because of this level of trust, a common shared credo, uh, the values, so that everybody knew exactly uh, what had to be done. And they did it in a very short period of time. Almost everything we talked about was somehow connected to hybrid or entirely remote uh, model of working. But in those models, it's much more difficult to influence em employees' behaviors, and that causes companies a problem. How do you think they can face it? Uh, well, I, again, I, I would um, only cite what we're finding in terms of research. First of all, uh, in hybrid work strategies, uh, it's clear that people have to share time in the office, okay? That means that uh, the less flexibility I have in choosing when I go to the office, the better. Um, hybrid strategies that require people to be in the office at certain times are much more successful than those that don't. Uh, we have a we're having a problem uh, in, in the U.S. By the way, in that managers who are practicing hybrid strategies aren't doing a very are not doing a very good job of of uh, uh, policing them. That is, if if an employee doesn't show up during the agreed upon time, uh, the the managers aren't uh, uh, following up and trying to encourage. Uh, everyone to be there at the same time. Again, a team can do that much better than a manager. Uh, team members can say, hey, where were you? You know, uh, we looked for you and you weren't there and uh, we went ahead, but uh, we sure would have liked to have had you there. And that will work much more effectively than the leader saying, you know, you were not here at a certain period of time. So prescribed times in the office. Uh, we're sort of migrating toward a three-day-a-week uh, policy for hybrid work uh, with Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the office, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the office, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, if you're trying to share an office, which is not working out very well. Um, remote work, uh, totally remote work, is a, is a different animal because you've got to uh, find ways of getting people together. For example, uh, Cemex is a, is a Mexican uh, a cement producer globally uh, with factories all over the world. Uh, and its people naturally work remotely on a global basis. That is, uh, in some way or other, we in an international organization, we all work remotely because uh, very few of us can get to the headquarters, wherever that might be. At Semex, however, the money uh, uh, saved by uh, decentralizing the operation is spent on bringing those managers together so that they can have a face-to-face -face experience. This is true also of remote work. You've got to get people in the same room, as I mentioned earlier. I think that we're headed also toward uh, a, a concept of uh, uh, the uh, employee counselor, that is, with everyone uh, having a personal consultant, somebody in or coach, uh, someone in the organization who takes a particular interest in what you're doing, uh, how you're doing it, whether you are being noticed, because Remote workers, their biggest fear is not being noticed, not being rewarded, not being recognized, not being promoted. Um, and there's 
there is a, a growing amount of evidence that remote workers do not get promoted uh, as as frequently as those who are in the office uh, and who are being uh, observed, who are visible, all the rest. So it's a legitimate fear. How do you counter it? I think you counter it by having a uh, someone in the organization who takes a particular interest in every or every employee who's working remotely so that uh, uh, those, those people do have an avenue of communication. They have someone at the home office who is speaking up for them, who is an advocate. Uh, that might be a better way, a better way to describe the job, advocate. Um, uh, and this may well be, this may well spell a uh, resurgence of middle management. You know, for years, but we've all been involved in eliminating middle management. You know, take a level out of the organization uh, and, and we we save a lot of administrative costs. My guess is we're going to be putting some of those people back in to help with the, the question of remote workers. It's not so, uh, not so important with hybrid work, but uh, with totally remote work, it becomes critical. There are already some companies that are having special officers that are concentrating just on that matter, how to keep uh, workers happy with coming back to the office. However, I can imagine it will be a big challenge since many of the workers really like working uh, remotely. Yes, but I would guess they also like to have someone who's looking uh, after them uh, after certain uh, elements of what they're doing. Yeah, we also have some data about uh, people who have a difficult situation in their house to work, that those people actually were looking forward to come back to the office. Yeah. Professor Heskett, thank you very much uh, for all those advices to the leaders and see you soon during the third session of the Elite Leadership Program. Thank you very much, Maria. It's been a pleasure to talk with you.